Hey everybody, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so excited to be here for those of you who are joining us. Uh, we are here today to talk about zoonosis, pandemics, and World Animal Protections Campaign that calls for an end to the global wildlife trade ahead of world leaders world leaders gathering for the G20 summit, uh, which is coming up in November. Uh, so let me introduce myself. My name is Aliyah Jasmine. I'm a television host and producer and environmental journalist. Uh, at the start of the pandemic, I did a story about the link between the illegal wildlife trade and COVID-19 uh, that got worldwide attention. And many of you may have seen some of my work on NBC News, the Discovery Channel, MTV News, among others. Uh, I currently live and work as a reporter here in Los Angeles, but my, my nationality is actually Canadian. Uh, I sit on the board of Nature United, which is the Canadian chapter of the Nature Conservancy. Uh, I was also just accepted as a fellow to the Canadian Geographic Society, and I am a global wildlife ambassador for world animal protection. So uh, I'm, I'm excited to be here. I am very, very much looking forward to diving in deeper into this issue about uh, zoonotic diseases. Um, and I'm sure all of you are excited to come join us as well. I encourage you to ask questions. This is a conversation with all of us, um, but it cannot happen without, without our special guest and expert. Joining me is the head of wildlife research and animal welfare at World Animal Protection, Dr. Neil DeCruz. He uses data to inform the development and implementation of practical solutions to reduce the unnecessary suffering of wild animals, as well as protected animal populations who are living in the wild. His efforts have actually helped improve the welfare and conservation status of species in over 40 countries and across six continents. And for all of you academic nerds watching, I encourage you to check out any one of his 50 peer reviewed scientific articles. Welcome, Dr. Neil. Hi, Leah Jasmine. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. So first of all, what time is it in your part of the world? Uh, it's just past seven o'clock in the evening here in, in London. Well, good evening to you. It is 11 a.m. here in Los Angeles. So I love that we are able to communicate with each other about a, an issue that's affecting us in, in both parts of our world and indeed all over the world. So uh, again, thank you so much for for doing this uh, publicly with everybody. Let me start by saying this. At the, at the beginning of the pandemic, I did this story, right, about um, pangolins and the link that this animal, which many people didn't know was, you know, the most, uh, one of the most, if not the most trafficked mammal in the world, let alone, you know, most people don't even know what a pangolin is. So I did this story and, uh, and it, it got a lot of attention. Um, I, I really want to dig deeper into, uh, into this illegal wildlife trade. In your professional opinion, is the wildlife trade responsible for the pandemic that we are currently living through? Yeah, I guess just, just to begin from the outset, I think there's no question at the moment about whether or not wildlife trade is, is front and centre at the origin of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic that we're all currently living through. Um, but before I come back to that, there are increasing questions about uh, where and when uh, COVID-19 originated and what animals were involved. <clears throat> and to, to give some examples, as you mentioned earlier, Jasmine, pangolins, these kind of scaly, uh, small cat-sized, domesticated cat-sized mammals were, were front and center early on, but, but so were snakes at one point in time. Um, and now it's kind of circled back to, um, to bats and they are now suspected to be the most likely, um, you know, kind of evolutionary host for COVID-19. Um, and the reason why it can be so difficult to now down which animal was actually involved is because um, you know in many cases a, a virus such as, as COVID-19 will use other animals as, as stepping stones in a process probably in this in this um, um, situation kind of um, the the recombination of the virus so the the, the virus um, basically it kind of um, has a genetic switch around as it's passed from from these different animal species to get to a point where it's able to actually infect a human cell and then humans are able to pass the virus on to other humans which is the situation of course which we have now with with COVID-19. So um, lots of different animals have been have been implicated. Bats, um, and I can I can maybe speak some more about bats later about why they're particularly uh, prominent when it comes to, to zoonotic disease transfer. But um, but no, wildlife trade itself is definitely front and center of of, of the process and where COVID nineteen originated. 
And you touched on this, but I think this is really interesting. If you've studied uh, human history and the way that human evolution has happened with agriculture and farming, you know that zoonotic diseases did not start with COVID-19. I mean, this is something that we as humans have endured for for a very, very long time. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about about that. For those people who are watching who may not know the history of zoonotic diseases, tell us a little bit about this. Sure. I mean, you know, COVID-19 is not the first zoonotic um, disease. So a disease that can be spread between animals and humans and, and you know, back, back the other way, we can pass zoonotic diseases back to animals. There's a, there's a long history. And, and one of the most kind of cited studies looked at the number of emerging infectious diseases. So those are the diseases that come from animals and, and don't come from animals. And between um, 1914 and 2004, they found over 300 different um, zoonotic emerging infectious diseases um, coming from, from um, you know, hundreds of, of different um, pathogens. Um, and what they found was that um, it, over 52% of those emerging infectious diseases were of, of animal origin. And then when you dive deeper into the zoonotic uh, infectious diseases, um, seventy-two percent of those come from wild animals, uh, and the remainder coming from domesticated animals, so um, farmed animals, and uh, more traditionally. So, in short, you know, wild animals have long been a, a recognised source of zoonotic diseases, and it, a lot of the um, the biology and behaviour of the animals and our changing behavioural patterns, um, you know, as human beings as a species, is increasing the likelihood of zoonotic diseases happening in future, and and these kind of disease outbreaks. Tell me why. Why is our behavior increasing the likelihood of these zoonotic diseases? Um, there's, there's lots of things that we're doing. Um, we are, are, you know, have the habitat destruction that's that's taking place, in increasing the interface between between people and animals. Um, we are intensively farming and um, domesticated animals, which is increasing the the, the ability for you know, the chances of zoonotic diseases emerging. But of course, we're here today to talk about today is is the wildlife trade and. We're talking about now a global, you know, billion dollar industry, which involves a huge variety of different animal species used for a variety of different reasons for entertainment, for, for tourism, for um, traditional medicine, for as exotic pets, uh, as, as bushmeat. And we are now in a situation where, you know, where wildlife markets have kind of come front and centre, where we can be, um, you know, as, a, as a either, um, you know, you know, for example, as a tourist, um, kind of directly and in some cases deliberately going to to a wildlife market to experience them. In some cases, just being close because they're they're in the centre of an urban area where you're you're travelling, um, and then you can be on a plane the next day and you can unintentionally, um, you know, transmit uh, a zoonotic disease, you know, within 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 days. Um, and so, yeah, our, our, the extent, the global scope and scale of the wildlife trade, the commodification of wild animals um, and, and other you know, aspects of modern life are just making the, the risk of zoonotic disease transmission just, you know, just, just go off the charts. Um, Dr. Neil DeCruz, we've, um, I'm getting a few, uh, I know a lot of people are asking questions. We want you to keep asking questions in your comment section. I just got a DM that I think is really interesting of someone mm -hmm. who is watching us live right now. Um, and they said that uh, if this isn't the first zoonotic disease, are they all caused by bats? Uh, and uh, from my research, the answer is no, but can you talk, I mean, when you think about like the swine flu, for instance, or these other zoonotic diseases, I mean, these are all examples of, of, of these kind of things, right? No, no, they're not, they're not all caused by bats. Um, but bats um, do feature quite heavily, especially with coronaviruses. Um, COVID-19 is one of, of a whole family of, of, of coronaviruses. And the reason why bats in particular have been Implicated, you know, we've got a long kind of cultural history as humans, you know, globally with with bats. Um, but there's kind of key aspects of their biology which experts believe make them particularly prone to to mm. be involved with with kind of zoonotic disease outbreaks. One is that they will tend to roost in, you know, they're quite famous for roosting in high high numbers. So you've got the ability for animals closely packed together to pass, for example, bacteria from from one another. You've also got the fact that, that both um, fruit-eating bats and insectivorous bats, so those that eat insects, um, you know, the locomotion of flight, they're, they're eating on the move, you know, so mm. they aren't able to fully ingest and digest the food. So there's the ability to, almost like a Wild West, you know, kind of Western where they'll spit out part of the food. That enables other animals to eat it. There's a, there's a transmission pathway there for, for, for infection. 
And of course, we can um, be susceptible to zoonotic diseases by bats biting us, for example, rabies, but also for us essentially biting them and, and eating them or, or, or consuming um, them as food. So um, the, I guess the other bit as well with bats is that, um, in some cases they hibernate. And if they do that, it gives the opportunity, for example, for a virus to survive a cold snap or a cold period that they, they otherwise wouldn't have been able to, to kind of to, to get through. So um, to know bats aren't, and, and it's very, you know, very important to highlight that bats aren't just bags of disease. You know, they're very right. important animals um, that have a key part of, of the ecosystem. And, um, you know, I'm sure everyone is aware they're mammals, but um, the key thing is that there's aspects of their biology there that make them particularly prone. Um, mm -hmm. And as I said, you know, you throw that into the fact that my, I myself have seen cages and, and cages of, of bats at markets intended for, for pets or as food. Um, you know, just, just literally just bat, bat droppings all over the, the cage, huddled together in really poor you know conditions. And you're just you're just asking for trouble. Um, yeah, and I think you bring up a really good point. I mean, it's really not, you know, regardless of the animal that may spread this zoonotic disease to humans, it's not the animal that's the issue. It's the way that the animals are kept, the, our, our proximity to those animals, uh, the, the hygiene uh, that they're kept in, right? I mean, what are some examples of uh, zoonotic diseases that have happened in the past and what were the animals that were in, implicated in those? Um, sure, so I mean, if, you, if you look at, um, you know, kind of the history of, of coronaviruses, SARS, so severe acute um, respiratory syndrome, and um, civets were, were highly implicated mm. uh, in another small kind of cat sized mammal. Um, and, um, you, know, it, you know, again, kind of going back from, there's, there's multiple ways in which um, civets are, are traded, that they're, they're kept um, and sold as exotic pets. Um, another key thing that's, that's really shown a boom um, in recent decades is civet coffee. So, you know, in, in places like Bali, where people go on holiday, and they will be asked to try civet coffee, which is where the animals are kept in in cages with um, kind of really um, kind of terrible flooring, which is just these metal bars, which are labels. Once the animals have eaten coffee, berries, or cherries, um, they will then um, you know do what what animals will do, and this, the droppings will come through the bottom of the the cage, and that's used to make this high end you know you know eighty dollar cup of coffee and coop and coffee, basically. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so you've got this situation where you've got um, animals just kept in in terrible conditions. You're actively, um, you know, going through their, their their poop, and and again, you just you're you're increasing the chances for for zoonotic disease transmission. As I said, they were they were implicated with with, with SARS. Um, um, okay, so we are getting a, a bunch of uh, questions here on Facebook. I'm just going to read some of them. This is from Tim Smithman, who says, can you speak to what needs to be done, both from a global and domestic perspective, to help prevent the next pandemic? That's a great question. Yeah, sure. I mean, and it, and it comes back to, to um, you know, World Animal Protection's um, campaign and why um, the G20 is being asked to to commit to, to ending the global wildlife trade. And, you know, I mean, beyond pandemics, there's a whole raft of reasons why wildlife trade um, commercial wildlife trade um, is 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 really bad for for the animals themselves for people and for planet. this isn't poop coffee by the way before we get yeah <laughs> um, so there's a whole raft of reasons why wildlife trade is, is is awful for wildlife people and planet and and the increasing chance of zoonotic disease is one and one which we're all unfortunately you know living and, and suffering through at the moment but in addition you know increasingly we're realizing that um, wildlife trade, although historically it was kind of viewed as um, it could put economic value on animals and it could help us to conserve them. You know, mm. recently um, global reports have shown that wildlife trade, um, and I'm, you know, I'm very specifically here not saying illegal wildlife trade, I'm saying wildlife trade and exploitation, oh. legal and illegal, is one of the second biggest drivers of, of species extinction. Um, and as we know, we're heading into the sixth mass extinction. Um, with, with a lot of some of the great documentaries that are coming at the moment that really highlight that this isn't this isn't a drill anymore. This isn't just um, something that will happen in generations to come. This is something that we're living through and going to start seeing now and experience our, ourselves. And it so, is. In sorry, go sorry, ahead. go ahead. No, no, you please. Um, I, I was just going to say, yeah. I mean, it's it's just making us realise now that that complacency. Um, mm -hmm. it, we do need to shake it up. We need to do something beyond the status quo and what we've tried in the past and 
and a commitment to the end of what I'd love to do. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard, but it, the commitment is where it starts. And that's what we're asking for with this, this true leadership. It's so interesting, right? I mean, that, and you, that's exactly what I was going to say was that this, the idea of ending the wildlife trade has been around for a very long time. World Animal Protection has been, and, and you in particular, have been uh, gathering data and doing this research. But this global pandemic has really brought this, this discussion into quite literally everyone's households, where now we are seeing a direct link of how this really impacts not only the wildlife out there who deserve to be free, but also uh, us as humans in our species. So I'll get to another question here. This is from Bim Wilkes, who is on Facebook. How can we put more pressure on our government to help end this trade? As I feel this trade makes billions for certain countries and they will not be keen on losing this revenue because in the main, in the main, this trade is driven by corruption and money. That's a really good question, doctor, because you know you did hit on this by saying, this isn't just the illegal wildlife trade, this is all wildlife trade. And in some countries, indeed, things are more legal than in other countries. So how do we put the this pressure on all governments, regardless of their individual value systems? Well, what can you do right now this second is you can you can sign a petition, of course, and, and put the pressure on the D20. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I think as you've highlighted, it's not just a legal trade, it is legal. I mean, and, and again, just look at it in terms of, of the pandemic, right? Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the numbers are very difficult to put a, a key figure on, but we are talking billions of dollars every year globally for the for the legal wildlife trade, so that, that you're allowed to do. But that is dwarfed by the trillions that are being spent at the moment post-COVID. And as I said earlier, there's question marks about which species were involved and how and when and, and exactly, you know, but the, the the fact that wildlife trade is a is a is a looming threat and was heavily involved, you know, is is where this this pandemic has come from is not in doubt. And so, so yes, I mean, it's time, you know, even if you you completely discard the intrinsic value of the animals, the fact that they have, you know, that they are sentient, that they can feel, um, um, you know, emotions, and they are um, cognitive, and you know, they they can think and feel and learn. Um, it's time, even if you're just a pure economist, the numbers mm -hmm. are off the charts in terms of what it's costing us retrospectively to pay for the damage that the wildlife trade, if you take it as a whole. Um, so let's get to this question from Polly Pan, who just came through on Facebook. One major MLAP operator said they have conducted hundreds and hundreds of shows in front of hundreds of thousands of people and not a single person ever has contracted anything. How on earth could they know that? Can you do you can you explain this question a little bit as well in your answer, Doctor? Yeah, sure. So I mean, we we get this question a lot in terms of um, you know, be it uh, an exotic pet exposition, be it a uh, border checkpoint with a live animal consignment coming through. Surely we just increase biosecurity protocols, and um, in some cases they're, they're they're stellar anyway, and they're fantastic and they're working. And the reality is, first of all, that animals may be sick um, and just not showing any symptoms. And so they may bypass. We're talking about huge numbers as well. For example, you know, you know, hundreds of, of animals in a consignment, if you're talking about something like an amphibian or a reptile, are they testing each and every one? You know, is it just one, one random sample? Um, in addition, as we've highlighted, there's also emerging diseases that we've never even encountered before. So how are you able to test for something when you don't know what it is you're looking for. So um, ultimately, you know, if, if you're really gonna take a caution, you know, a really cautionary um, approach to this, you know, what's the best way of stopping the disease from from, from coming across? Um, it's to stop the animal being traded in the first place. Um, and, you know, and this is what the, the, the G20 um, petition ask is about. It's focusing on one of the key transmission pathways, which, is you know, wildlife trade markets have, have quite rightly been in the news and, and you know focus of a lot of conversations, but they're not the only stage of the trade chain. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's this international commercial trade. You know, we're not talking about for conservation purposes, so animals can be moved across borders for a century. We're talking about where animals are being moved in huge numbers, in terrible conditions, in many cases legally, for personal pleasure, profit luxury it's that element that we can just cut out and just you know just have this massive impact not only on the animals themselves but also wild populations and and ultimately even if you don't care about any of that oh 
that's my little foster puppy who's trying to get into the conversation, if you can hear him. Okay, <laughs> okay, so I'm going to get to Cassandra's question here. But before I do, I, I do want to ask you something I'm seeing pop up from a lot of people, which is simply why are more people not just making this link? I mean, taking wild animals from their habitats is obviously cruel. But as you said, it has horrible economic implications, even if you don't have that connection to wild animals. And in a very selfish level, it's actually hurting our species as humans, as we can now all see with this pandemic. So why are more people not making this link? Um, there's there's a whole range of, of different reasons. I think um, one of the one of the the first, I guess, is at the moment where many of us are just dealing with the fallout of COVID-19 in our own lives and struggling to kind of come to, to terms of that that new new reality in addition in some situations it's it's actually their their love of animals that's that's almost making them blind to that um to, you know to the to the suffering that's involved um you know um in many cases they won't see how the animal was sourced from the wild how it was caught and captured and transported how many died as a result so that one could survive um the trade chain how they're packaged how they're shipped how they're treated like commodities and in addition, and a very important part, which has direct relevance to the zoonosis um, aspect, is that in many cases, the solution to um, the, the kind of the conservation or sustainable use um, is to, to farm them commercially. So to pack wild animals into intensive um, you know, conditions and speed breed them in many cases to try and meet consumer demand. And what you're doing there is putting animals into um, poor welfare, stressful conditions, which lowers their immune system. And again, just it's another way of increasing the chances of zoonotic diseases being spread between individuals um, and, and potentially emerging. So um, in short, I think one key thing beyond us just kind of being removed from it is there is that, that risk that our desire to be close to wild animals and not seeing the full trade chain is is maybe um, um, making us, um, you know, become involved with something that if we could see all those aspects, mm -hmm. we would probably decide not to. And I think that's especially important in this world of social media as we're all at home. Um, many of us are still isolating, many of us are working from home. And you're seeing that on, uh, for example, on Instagram or on social media, people are posting about these new animals that they got, whether it's like me fostering, you know, a dog, but some people are also posting about these monkeys they've adopted or parrots that they've adopted. And I think it's really important, as you said, that sometimes realizing that people aren't inherently evil, it comes from a love of animals and it's important to educate educate them that where did that monkey or parrot come from, right? And what was the implications of that? Um, yeah. I think is really important. Exactly. And I think it extends across the whole trade chain. This isn't about people, um, I think, necessarily being evil. It's about people misunderstanding animals, their biology, their behavior, what they need, you know, and, and, and I had this conversation a lot with, with, with people and it's, but but, you know, Neil, all of the animals survived the process. This animal has survived to a long, it's lived longer than it would have ever lived in the wild. But it's like there is a difference between surviving and thriving. There is a difference between actually having a good quality of life. And the reality is, unlike you know, like the, the puppy that you're fostering, wild animals have not gone through this domestication process of mm -hmm. thousands of years of, of you know, co-evolving with us to a point where they can cope in our living rooms. They are part of our pastoral of our daily life. We're talking about animals, which in, in many cases, you know, you know, they just there's no way you could come anywhere close to providing them with the range of experiences that will fully meet what their, their biology and behavior um, require. So there is that real distinction. Um, but yes, so for everyone, everyone watching who's thinking of getting a cute pet while they're at home, think about perhaps fostering a puppy or a cat uh, or from your local shelter instead. Uh, uh, Jenny Jahan says, why are you asking the G20 in particular? What if they don't listen? Uh, the G20, because they are, they are by, you know, by definition, and I know they've been selected, um, they're influential, they're influential countries. And um, they, they had the ability to move very quickly and very fast as a result. And what they, what they decide and recommend isn't necessarily legally binding from the start, but that um, also gives them the, the speed and the ability to quickly make decisions and to to provide those recommendations. So, in short, highly influential um, group of countries there that could really make a difference. And so, and it's, again, it's that commitment that make will make a real difference. I think it might. This might also be really important to talk to you about as well. Um, 
is the idea that a lot of this conversation that people have heard, uh, a lot of awareness about, for example, wet markets has really emerged during this pandemic, right? Um, and uh, that is very often um, when we talk about like the wet markets in China and there's certain countries that are implicated on this. So with the COVID-19 debate, a lot of that has focused on the wet markets selling wildlife, especially wild meat. Do you think that that is a correct narrative that we've been hearing or is there more to that story? I, I think there's definitely more to that story. I think there's, you know, wildlife markets are are a, a cauldron of, of contagion. You know, they are, they are, um, super spreader events in terms of because you're just taking so many different um, animal species from different locations that would never come into contact with each other you put them into close proximity in in awful conditions and the the, the lowered immune systems etc just provide rife opportunity for viruses for bacteria for parasites for all of the different kind of kind of um, germs for the lack of a better phrase to to spread and emerge but as I mentioned earlier, that's not the only that's not the only step. There's there's wildlife farms where these animals are being commercially, um, you know, captive bred. Um, in many cases, um, there's no biosecurity. I've been to facilities myself where there's no biosecurity whatsoever. Um, and in addition, there's also the transport. There's the movement of animals in huge numbers, legally and you know not just illegally, between countries. And this is something where, as we mentioned earlier, even if you've got the best biosecurity protocol in the world, there's still that risk that zoonosis could be could be spread um, either to people or, or, or brought in with the, with the animals. So um, this is something that, um, yeah, definitely goes beyond just just wildlife markets. And it's something we need to take seriously. So please, you know, do do sign a petition. And, uh, you know, you've been talking about this petition. Um, obviously, this is on, uh, we have it scrolling at the bottom. This is worldanimalprotection.org uh, slash G20, where you can sign this petition. Um, I do uh, want to ask you about this petition because you do keep talking about it. And I think it's interesting because uh, you're, I mean, you're talking about an outright ban on the wildlife trade, right? And uh, I'm curious if this is really a practical way to deal with what we are all experiencing right now, which is a pandemic. Like, is it is an outright ban on the entire wildlife trade a practical way to deal with all future pandemics? So the, the key thing here is at the moment, the um, the ask of the G20 is a commitment. So it's to, it's to essentially aspire to a bigger goal rather than the end goal to be a booming, flourishing wildlife trade is to have a happy, healthy planet. And mm -hmm. it's about raising up to ensure that, you know, the, the sustainable development goals, they're admirable, you know, peace, uh, you know, stop environment, uh, environmental degradation to reduce poverty. Those are admirable goals and we have to follow them. But it's how we get there that I think it needs to be needs to be addressed. And it's very much in the first stage here. We're talking about commercial wildlife trade. We're talking about the, the luxury use of wild animals as exotic pets. Um, as entertainment that's the aspect that we're looking at it's that international cross-border first step and so yeah in short it won't be easy getting to um, getting to um, a point where we've ended um, the global commercial wildlife trade but equally it's challenging as we've seen to regulate it and I think ultimately it's it's that should be our goal it's a it's a happy healthy planet that doesn't rely on that rather than than a booming flourishing wildlife trade that we need to aim for Right. And, you know, we didn't even get into to this as much, um, Doctor, but I mean, even the, the consequences that this has on um, biodiversity loss, right, as we, we talk more and more about climate change uh, and the climate crisis. I mean, I, that's a huge part of this conversation, I think, as well. And we want the conversation uh, to continue. Um, doctor, I do have to ask you, I know we, we promised we would keep this to half an hour. I could talk to you for days about this. Um, and I uh, I do want to uh, make sure that if there's anything that you, as we end this conversation, if there is anything that you feel like I didn't ask you or the public who are watching haven't asked you yet that you think is really important for all of us to know and take away from this conversation. Um, you know, I think just, just that you can, you can make a difference. And, um, you know, don't, you know, don't just don't forget you, you can choose to be a consumer or you can choose not to be a consumer. And, um, you know, when it comes to to things like exotic pets for for civic coffee uh, for for wildlife as as entertainment, you know you have that ability to make a difference. Um, and, and in addition to to you know joining our call for for the G20 and and that really influential group to to make that commitment to to shift away 
and, and to ban uh, the commercial global wildlife trade. So please, please do help. Thank you so much, Dr. Neil DeCruz, for all of you who are watching. I, I really encourage you to look into uh, the doctor's work and incredible research and data that has been compiled over the years and uh, such incredible work for world animal protection um, because that data and that research uh, really brings this, you know, this idea and this, these emotions that we feel uh, into a really tangible way to look at numbers and, and inevitably, hopefully, lead to real and lasting change, especially on the global stage as we do approach leaders uh, at events like the G20 Summit. So for all of you who are watching, uh, I just want to uh, remind you um, that uh, if you do, I know that a lot of you are writing in right now, we're not getting to everybody, but if you do want to uh, participate in this change, this conversation does continue, you can head to World Animal Protection's website. Uh, they, as of right now, have over 800,000 signatures, uh, and and that's 800,000 voices that are trying to be heard. Uh, the goal for World Animal Protection is to have 1 million signatures. So almost there, 200,000 left to go. Uh, so I encourage you, if you do want your voice to be heard and you do want to uh, follow up on what uh, Dr. Neil DeCruz says, uh, go check that out, sign that petition. Uh, it is gonna be delivered to the G20 leaders ahead of their annual leader summit on November 21st and 22nd. Thank you guys all so much. I'm Aliyah Jasmine. Feel free to reach out to me on social media and let me know what you thought of this and, and follow up with your questions or comments. But we thank you all uh, for your participation, even being here and being part of this dialogue really makes a difference in making the world a better place for animals. So thank you so much and we'll talk soon. Bye.